couple of them. Okay, uh, continue. Um, yes, go ahead. So um, he asked about, you know, kind of a general question about putting your, using other people in, in your story and how do you avoid people getting upset? How do you avoid people saying, I resent this? And I was saying that one of the things I tell people is that, which is true, is that every character in a novel um, or in the play, I'm rewriting the play right now for taking the characters down from 25 to eight for um, hopefully for large scale distribution. It's, I've been invited to do it, to submit to an international distributor. So we'll see how that goes. You never know. But, it, but even for the play, for the uh, little bit for the movie and for the book, um, every character that I write is really me. One, one, you know, we, and that's for the, for everybody, whether it's a male, a female, a non-binary person, it doesn't matter. Um, what's coming out of their mouth and their actions are yes, partially based on real people, often based on imagination, but definitely based on myself and how I wrote a piece about, a. um, a friend of the narrator of the book, loosely based on me, who gets upset that um, in 1970 that he's looking up at the moon and raging about there's a there's a flag in a golf cart and that it makes my palms sweaty. And what he's describing is anxiety. So I was describing my own anxiety that I had back in those in, in those days or other times where I would get anxious um, looking up at at the vastness of the universe. And I'd feel like I was going to be, you know, sucked up into it or something, just sort of a free floating anxiety that, that so many of us feel. Um, so that's one of the ways. And I think you just say, listen, uh, maybe I was thinking about you. So Kevin, you could say something like, maybe I was thinking about you. Um, if I was, and, and you're offended, I apologize, but really this is coming from me. And, and, uh, I also had numerous people um, who said, and it was, it was so funny to me when they would do this and I, I could never, um, I, I never wanted to say no. They'd say, I, I know who such and such character was. And I'd say, oh, okay, who? And they'd say, that was based on me. And I said, oh, okay, yeah. Well, I'm glad you, you know, what'd you think? Oh yeah, I was, I was really flattered. And, and I had never thought of that person. That person had never entered that mind when I was writing it. So that's so, kind of, that was funny. You yeah. know, I'm not a writer. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, except for putting things on my calendar, basically. But I so admire and I realize that when you talk about this, translating your life and it, you, that decision of writing a memoir you know, or your actual personal remembrances of something versus putting it into fiction, you're so vulnerable if you write a memoir. Yes. So I think what Kevin is saying, you want to really write what happened. You have something to say about that, but you don't want to offend people. So translating it into fiction and getting those tools to do that mm -hmm. is really, really important because that allows you to go ahead with what you're thinking, but at the same time, protecting people that you might want to protect and yes. including yourself and so absolutely yeah um it also gives you tremendous freedom to um i was just writing down some notes today and let me see if i can come up with some of the benefits or some of the ways that i put it um when you write fiction um let's see so I wrote down the profound difference among the novel. No, oh, this is a different, um, a different point. Let me make that point later. So what I, one thing I wrote down is if you don't think your life is interesting, that's where fiction can also come in. You can think of your experience as the, sort of the framework of, of, of the story, but then you can expand it. You can decorate it. You can change its location. And then you can tear it down and build something new um, so there, you have a ton of freedom with fiction to take a character and change that character. What I was mentioning yesterday was that, um, with that same character, Hairball, I had written him as a, 
there's a guy who got drafted and went to Vietnam and um, came back uh, with PTSD and very violent. And then one night I woke up three, four o'clock in the morning, almost like he had been knocking at my, the door of my consciousness. And I woke up and I remember, I remember this very well. And, and basically this character in my mind was saying, that's not what happens to me. I thought, so I got up the next day I thought, or actually, I just sat down on my computer and started writing. Um, and what I realized is that what, what would really have happened if he was drafted? Now, I don't know what happened because um, I watched the draft with, with a, a few friends. He was not among them. And I don't really remember it very well because we were also completely paralyzed with, with anxiety that we, we were going to get drafted. All I knew is I had a high number and I was not going to get drafted. Um, but I thought, so what would he have done? And what he, what I imagined him doing was something I later found out people actually did, which was nothing. He threw his draft notice on the, on this kitchen table that I imagined for this story that was based on a, a real place, um, this old rundown farmhouse. Um, and he left it on the table and all the guys that were living there, the four, four guys plus people coming in and out. It eventually got soaked with beer and tea and water and just eventually disintegrated. And they never came after him. And I later found out that, and I was able to expand on it, that in real life, that happened to people because it was pre-computer. Yes, there were computers, but they were the size of, of you know, a living room, uh, IBM computers that were churning out punch cards. So it wasn't like somebody could go to a keyboard and pull up his name. And they forgot about some people. Um, if a draft record got lost behind a filing cabinet, it was, it, was, it was it, it was gone. Or somebody stole it or broke in or set fire. Um, so that's what he did. And then the whole story took a different direction. And I had somebody else that went over to Vietnam based on someone I actually met. Um, another person, not a close friend, but someone I knew who did become a sniper and did come back with terrible PTSD. So you take, um, one of the things you do also, Kevin um, and Alex, is to, is to take uh, the idea of um, composite characters. Can't emphasize enough how important that is. For example, there's a character in the book and in the movie and in the play, and he's gonna stay, I'm cutting one of the guys in the house, but for the pared down, um, second version of the play. His name is Phil. He is based on um, a guy named Dave, who's still a friend. Um, phys physically, he resembled some of these guys, who's a musician. Another guy named Chris, who I can just tell you who that is. It's Chris Butler, who is um, world renowned in certain circles. He was uh, the founder of the band The Waitresses, and he has a famous Christmas song called. Um, um, oh, I, I hear it every year so often. Um, I'll think of it. Uh, and then he had I Know What Boys Like, which became the theme song for a television show. Uh, and he had a fictional band called The Waitresses. And when his song became a hit, he had to form a real band and they toured. Um, eventually Aunt landed him on the cover of Rolling Stone. And he was one of the guys in the house who was an inspiration. Um, he would walk up and down the halls playing scales on his guitar, 1971-ish, two or something. And he'd, he'd just repeat the mantra, I'm gonna be famous, I'm gonna be famous, I'm gonna be famous. And sure enough, he got famous. Um, but he was also on the green that day at Kent State when the National Guard um, fired and killed um, people he knew, including a friend he was standing next to. So he had some PTSD, PTSD. Um, and I still keep in, in close touch with, with Christopher. Um, it was also based on a guy named Ray, who has passed on, um, who is a guitarist and a friend of mine I played in a band with, and really one or two other people. So it's very um, true and realistic to say to someone, that's a composite character. And you might see a little bit of yourself in there, but I was not thinking of you at that time. And the great thing about composite characters is they can um, 
they can do anything. You can have them do anything. So I think the most important thing is to not be constricted by what real people you're thinking of actually have done in real life. So making them composites gives you a lot of freedom. Um, it, it, it enables you to go in any direction. You can go forward, sideways, up and down. And um, so villains, okay. Um, the villain in the year that trembled was, um, it was, it was, as they used to say, man versus, but I say person versus, you know, there's person versus person, person versus, versus environment. Um, there are different conflicts, but there's person versus uh, society. And so this was a, a story about person versus society, um, not person versus person. So society meaning the, the weight of the war in Vietnam pressing down upon, or as the Vietnamese say, the American war, um, pressing down upon this group of people, what would happen to them? Who would go, who would stay, who would die, who would live? So, um, but when you have a real villain, like I had have in my second novel, Vengeance Follows, a real bad guy, that character is based on, he's a composite, but there are a couple, especially one that I have very much in mind. You may know it, um, but I changed it enough so that, you know, there's nothing you can do. I'll never forget when Paul S. Erickson, um, uh, my first publisher, wonderful, wonderful guy who um, from Vermont, who had been a literary lion in, um, in New York City. Um, he was a fierce defender of, of First Amendment rights when it came to fiction. So let's see if I have it around here somewhere. Here, I'll, this, this is the first edition of the book. Let me grab this a second. So he said, um, I said, well, Paul, I'm a little bit worried about some of these characters. You know, like, am I going to get any blowback or get sued? And he said, the moment you put this on there, a novel, he said, you're clear. And I said, you don't have to do any legal work? He said, no. So that's why you always see on novels, a novel. Um, so anyway, I don't want to just keep talking. Kevin or Alex, do you have any questions? I've got all kinds of things to talk about, and I can fit them in your questions um, about how to translate your life into fiction. And that would be into um, novel, short story, screenplay, or play, basically, or the fiction forms I know the best. Poetry I love, but I don't know it as well. Scott, do you do storyboards or how, how do you um, map out your story? Well, that's a great question. One that's never been asked. Um, so for the year that trembled, I did map it out. Um, I'm looking up there because that, that's the new play that I'm working on or the new version of the play. Um, I did not do that much for Vengeance Follows, but so I'll talk about the year that trembled. I had, um, I had both up on the wall and then I had on a piece of paper um, X amount of chapters and I would, I would fill them in. Like I'd write a chapter and I'd think that doesn't go next. That goes in the second half of the book or in the final third of the book. Um, so I've just started rewriting this 25 person play into, um, into um, a eight person play for general release. And this is, see if I can show this to you. This is where I am right now with it. I don't know, it's probably backwards, but you can see that I just have um, act one and act two, I've got actually five scenes that I'll be writing um, for um, act one and six scenes as of now for act two. So I do think that planning tends to help once you start to um, see it take shape in your head. Um, John Irving says that 
he absolutely must know what is going to happen, what the ending's going to be. I did know that with uh, The Year That Trembled, because the last sentence was the first thing I ever wrote before I knew what the book was about. And then I wrote the first sentence. Um, others do not agree with that. There are, there are some that say, I need, like, I'm talking about great, famous authors who say things like, I needed to know where um, where this was going to go. And, uh, or I, I need, I need to follow my characters to know where it's going to go. Um, I think it's a really good idea to know where you're going to go. I did it the other way with Vengeance Follows and it, by necessity, because it started out a very different book than it, than it became. It wasn't until I knew what was going to happen. And I actually didn't know the ending. And this happens too. Um, I didn't know the ending until I wrote it and I liked it that way. So I think you have to make decide for yourself and um, you know, you just make that decision. You see if it's working for you. And if not, I get out the bulletin board or a whiteboard and I'd start to create um, they're not um they're not storyboards because I'm, I'm no artist. It would be a bunch of stick figures and, and like childish looking renderings. But if you're someone like Alex, who is an artist and actually did um, with some of his essays in our class, um, showed us some beautiful renderings of Moscow, for example. It was Moscow, correct, Alex? Um, and, and just, I mean, it brought it to life. So his was a little more graphic. At, you know, at CIA, you're going to get more people that can do that. I'm not one of them. Um, but the way he did it, it just, it just worked. It was really, really nice. Um, so anything, um, does that answer that? Or do you want to know like no, I'm sure any other that. element of it? No, it does. And I like too that the other one that you wrote um, that you were more surprised or maybe not surprised, but you didn't know the ending when you started one of them right yeah the second <clears throat> because, one because normally with things i've written whether it's well it's usually poetry that if i've written poetry um i'm often surprised by the ending uh because once i started i didn't really know where i was going with it but i've made so many notes over the years about so many different you know ideas that fly through my head for plays or a screenplay or something and I'll write down certain things that I do want in the ending or want to happen. But um, no, that most certainly answered my question. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, when you're talking, it, it brought to mind Robert Frost's quote, no surprise in the writer, no surprise in the reader, no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader. So if I apply those quotes no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader, that would apply to me for The Year That Trembled, which was a, an emotional journey um, about loss and um, loss of innocence, loss of friendship, loss of life, and loss of innocence for the entire country, not to mention um, individuals. Vengeance Follows is what publisher and others called a literary thriller. So I wasn't quite sure what was going to happen until I wrote it. And that worked for me because I didn't, you know, it was kind of a surprise ending and it has a, it has a, a false ending before, before it, it, kind of what you would typically see in a, in a movie where you think it's over, you think it's solved. And then you realize, Oh my God, that thing, that deadly thing is still there. Or, you know, I forgot, um, I forgot to prepare. I forgot my car keys. In this case, it's not car keys. But so you kind of have to figure out what kind of story you're writing. If it's just a literary fiction um, story, you might want to know where it's going to go. But that can change. You know, I know I worked on that last page or last paragraph many, many times. I thought about changing the last sentence um, and I tweaked it, but I never changed it. Um, I wrote it walking down the street in New York City in 1993 after I'd gone to the Breadloaf Writers Conference and decided I wanted to write a book that 
started and ended in the meadow. And I just had this thought, I ducked into a delicatessen, um, took out my notebook and wrote it down. It's in a box somewhere. And then that night I was with, um, I was by myself. So I called up this buddy of mine that I met at the Red Love Writers Conference in 93 and I, from a phone booth on Broadway. And I said, Jared, I think I just, he was from Ireland. He said, I think I just may have written the last line to a novel. And he said, well, well read it to me. And I, so I read it to him and he said, oh man, that's, that's freaking beautiful. Except he didn't say freaking. He said, okay, I'll tell you. He was very matter of fact. He said, okay, I'll tell you what you're gonna do. Meet me at Kennedy's on West 57th uh, in two and a half hours. He was out on Long Island. And we're gonna talk about this novel of yours. So I met him there. We, we got an Irish whiskey, we toasted, literally got an Irish whiskey at this Irish bar called Kennedy's. Um, and, and he said, um, all right, read that. Let me, let me see that line. He said, okay, okay. He said, do you know, do you know what your first line has to be? I said, no. He said, write this down. I lived beside a meadow. And that's the first line. It's, it's remained the first line since, since that moment. So I spent the next two and a half years filling in <laughs> between the first line and the last line. That's fairly rare, but um, that's just how it happened. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways that it can happen. I think you have to be open to change, but also open to following your vision. And you have to balance those things. That makes sense. Thank you. Cheryl or Alex, either of you have anything? So I don't, uh, you know, I don't know you, but your bio says that you were a businessman and you had mentioned that tonight. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and a blues drummer. So at what point do you say, I'm giving up my life as I know it, which is pretty stable, to do this writing, spend to dedicate more time to doing this writing. That's a big move. Well, and yeah, I'm sure time. that students in your class might struggle with that. that. You know, that's a great question. And I can actually give you a, a very specific answer. It was in two parts. So in 1991, I was working with my dad and I was actually, um, my dad and a few other guys um, and women in a sales company. But I knew I wanted to do something else. I didn't know what. So I said, listen, you know, at that point I was running it, but I, I thought I, this is not what I want to do. I said, I will work with you. I, I took some product lines and sold them on my own, established my home office. And I was living on the lake in Cleveland. And um, so I did that part time. I did some other things, but then I mostly did sales. So I would work all day and then I would take a break and and I'd start writing at night. So in November of 91, I got my first column, which was Cleveland Magazine. And quickly I got other newspaper columns so that by probably February of 92, I was writing about a dozen columns a month, but still working. And I continued to work um, in, in my business and in writing uh, until 1998, when my novel came out, um, and I was still working in business. My novel came out and um, we, I met the director who wanted to direct the movie. And we formed a company to, um, to do the movie, um, which would be essentially a full-time thing. But I still didn't stop doing um, business on my own because I couldn't support myself solely through my writing. And that changed in, um, I think it was, was it 2001 when we were uh, in pre-production? Um, no, it was, it was in 98. So in 1998, yeah, in 1998, I won a fellowship to the Swanee Writers Conference. When I say it's a good question, I actually have to think about these, these dates. I won a um, fellowship, which is, it's prestigious, but it doesn't mean anything financially. Um, and so I was down at Swanee. I was trying to figure out what I'm going to do. 
And so I had a, an assistant and I, and I called up my assistant and I said, call the manufacturer of this product. And I was doing the sales, but I had partially helped to in, kind of invent the product, to create it, which Alex might be interested in because Alex, I believe is in um, industrial design, I believe. Um, and so um, I said, set up a meeting for when I get back um, because I, I was, did not know I was going to get this movie off the ground. And so I set up a meeting and I sold the, the, the uh, my part of the product line along with a partner that I had and a sales partner. And so I made enough money to kickstart the um, movie company. And then we started to raise money for the movie, but I was able to pay for our rent, uh, pay for um, my nephew who came along to work for me, who had just graduated in film at the University of Florida. And he's now a very well-known um, or quite well-known movie producer. He's produced about a dozen movies. Um, I haven't worked with him since the first one, but that kind of got his, his career going. And so um, really it was about seven years of doing both. Um, and then finally I said, this is it. This is where I jump off and it's do or die. So after that, um, after the movie came out, made some money on it, it did, you know, sort of okay. But then I had to take, um, while I was doing more creative projects, I had to take other writing works. So what I did was I shifted from, um, I did, I shifted from corporate sales and marketing to corporate writing. And I wrote for everybody from, you know, huge companies like Oracle, ABB, um, to videography companies, to small companies. I would do corporate histories and all of that, all the while trying to come up with my next plan, which then became teaching and, and writing full time. So it was in stages. Um, and I think what I would tell anybody, and I'm probably gonna emphasize, emphasize this more in my classes at CIA, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Um, very few people have a bestseller. I mean, the, it, the odds are astronomically small. Um, if you're James Patterson or um, you know, any number of bestselling authors, yeah, you can do it full time. But you'll note that many of the even very successful literary fiction authors are, are teaching. Um, and that's generally because they need to. And, they, and in my case, I love it. And some of them love it and some of them don't, um, as I've learned. But um, it, it's very rare to have that. And then every now and then somebody hits it out of the park. I was very close a couple of times um, where the play was picked up and then dropped because um, of the politics of the play. Um, an acquisitions editor was overruled by the executive editor. Um, and some other things that happened. NBC wanted to um, option the year that trembled. And I told them, no, I won't entertain your offer. And um, the, the woman from NBC said, wait a minute, what, what are you doing? And I said, well, I've given my word to a director and to my nephew, and we're going to make this movie ourselves. And eventually it became a close to $2 million movie, but that took a long time. And she said, but, but you're not making the movie right now. I said, no. And she said, but this has to be a movie. I said, I know that's why I'm making it. She said, you really don't want to hear how much we're going to offer? And I said, no. She said, why? And I said, because I don't want to wake up in the future, you know, doubting myself if this doesn't work out. I now wish I would have at least known what she was gonna offer. So she said, okay, all right. Well, you gotta do what you gotta do, I guess. I said, okay. So I walked out in the outer office where my nephew and our assistant was. And I said, I'm gonna give you a guarantee that NBC in about an hour is going into a development, a development meeting for a version of the year that trembled about six to nine months later, and I could look it up, um, a miniseries came out on NBC called The 60s. It had four students from Kent State. It had 
um, things that happened at home, people that went, letters from Vietnam. It had basically the bones of the year that trembled. Nothing you can do. There's, and and that's, that's the sad part that I have to tell students, good luck. And that's not the only thing that happened. I, I'm not gonna get into that litany um, with MTV and Comedy Central and Bill Maher and all kinds of crazy stuff that happened in my career. I'm not alone, it happens to a lot of people. So one of the things is you just have to set your, your uh, direction and just go and hope that it works out. Um, maybe I should have sold to them. Um, maybe not, there were two other producers that wanted it. One said, who was very powerful, took me out in her Porsche and said, in Hollywood and said, you gotta fire these two people you're working with and I'll get you this star. And these are like A-list stars and I'll get you this star, but you got to rewrite the script yourself. I don't like the script your director wrote and we'll do it. And I said, no, I said, I've already given my word. So th these are the things that happen. And now sometimes people will say, okay, I'll sell it to you. And the movie will go into what's called turnaround and that will go on for years. Um, um, Cheryl, do you know Mary Doria Russell? Um, well, she was very successful, sort of really intellectual, literary fiction, sci-fi. And she wrote a terrific book called, not The Phoenix, um, I'll, I'll think of it. Um, and it was optioned by Brad Pitt. So that would have been like if I would have let this producer option it or NBC. And she let him option it, but the problem with that was that it went into turnaround for about 20 years. Um, and sure enough, she just waited and waited and waited. Um, oh, the Sparrow. I didn't even have to look. I, uh, it's called the Sparrow. And she had given up on it. She'd get paid every three years, you know, when they would um, re-up on the option. But it didn't... Um, didn't get made. And that's what they call um, turnaround hell where uh, a movie or a book rather gets optioned and then they just take it out of the system, which is done all the time. And I wanted to make sure that the year of the trouble got made. So Mary Dury Russell just sort of stopped worrying about it. And about a year ago, I think it was, she got a call from um, the producer of um, for the, from the writer and creator of um, the famous, the chess uh, Netflix, um, what, what's the, that mini series that came out uh, with Anya? Queen's that? Gambit. Queen's Gambit, which was, I thought, terrific. It's now being written and created by the guy from Queen's Gambit. So you never know. Um, it can, it can disappear from sight as many authors have seen their books do, or in Mary's case, um, after 20 years or so, and I think it's been close to that, 15, 20 years, um, suddenly the right person comes along and says, you know what, I actually am gonna do this. Um, so you take your chances on the decisions that you make. Um, and, you know, I never had those other things happen I wouldn't have met my wife. I, I wouldn't have my son. So did it work out? Yeah. I also had the experience of producing a, a movie, which was amazing and scary and took years and years. Um, but it was, it was something else. Um, and, or, or doing the play or anything else. So I think, you know, it tends to work out in the end. You never know what's going to happen. But uh, they will in Hollywood, once they get their hands on an idea, if you don't want to work with them, they'll change the names and, and, and all of that. I mean, I remember when I saw it, I was, it was one of those things where I was just frozen in front of the TV. Oh my God, here it is. You know, it's about nine months. So it's, it's a very tricky game. And that's why it's good to have a fallback position. I think if someone is really determined and really young, um, but the days of, of moving to New York and waiting tables, mm. 
not so viable anymore. You know, you may be moving to New York and, and waiting tables or, or working at Starbucks and writing. Yeah, you can do that. Actually, it can still be done, but there's a lot of competition. The thing is, good material will tend to make its way. So as long as you can kind of stay viable and support yourself. Um, but my situation was different in that I had an actual, um, not that it was a better career, but I had a, you know, I was an executive in a sales company. And that's the kind of thing where had I not left at 39 years old, I may have just kept going with it. And then I never would have known. And I love what I do now, which is to write and teach. So anything else, any other, anything at all? We've got what, about 13 minutes or so? Scott, can well, I ask you? Oh, go on, yeah. Cheryl. I was just going to say, it must be very satisfying that even though you turned down the big corporation that you did see your book get published, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then turned into a play and into a film. So, you know, that struggle, I guess, that pathway is, is very satisfying. You didn't take the easy way out and let someone else control your work. So, right. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I'm, I actually wrote the, I wrote the play myself and the, the play was much closer to the book. And the second version of the play for the general audiences is, is going to be even more close to the book in terms of tone and tightness and movement. Um, there was more comedy and, and more youth in the original youthfulness Mm -hmm. um, and lots of young characters in this high school play where there were 26 roles, 25 roles. And so, yeah, it, it is immensely satisfying. I never would have had, never would have learned the things I learned, learned about movies from the inside. Um, so when I teach screenwriting, I teach the writing piece of it, but I also teach, this is what producers, because I was a producer for quite a while and also produced a TV show um, that was about to get sold and then something happened with one of the stars and, and, and that kind of fell through. But, but I have been a producer and I know what producers look for. And more importantly, I know what they don't like. Um, and I kind of feel like it's my, I don't wanna say my mission, but it's one of my great goals to impart to students that um, is that, the things that they need to do to get their screenplays read. And that even includes form, uh, like the format. I, I, I request that the format is perfect, not perfect, nothing can be perfect, but writing the way um, an agent in Hollywood would look at mm -hmm. it. And if it's not written in the technical format, it's gone. It could be the best thing since Citizen Kane and they will not read it. And things like too many setups, like too many scenes. Um, are you gonna have, you know, a hundred setups where they have to keep moving their trucks and their lights and their food and their actors and, and their extras uh, and everybody else? Or can you do it in six or seven setups? Um, so, and that can really help. So um, those are things that I, I learned uh, I don't want to say the hard way, but I learned from the inside, you know, what does an assistant director do? What does a camera puller do? You know, a focus puller, um, that sort of thing. And, and it's been kind of fun. It's a lot of, uh, a lot of stress for there for a while. Now, having said that, um, I'm about to get my screenplay into circulation. I'm more than happy to let someone else produce the second screenplay. I wanted to do one, so I knew what, you know, what it was like. But um, a lot of screenwriters are paid. They're either, they're told to stay off the set. I knew one guy, I won't say his name. He was paid to stay off the set of the movie. And he was a nice guy. It wasn't like he was going there and screaming and yelling. Um, they don't like screenwriters around, unless they do, unless it's... Um, Martin Scorsese, for example, mm -hmm. he will often want the screenwriter to be there and say, now, what, how do you see this? Um, when I did the play, the director, the first time we did it, we did it in 2003 and 2013. 
And the director was glad I was there every night because I would literally sit there. And I remember Peter, he's a great guy. He lives in LA now. He was playing the, the lead role of Casey, which is the narrator um, of the book and, and one of the main characters in the play. And he'd look out and he'd say, Scott, I, I'd say, yeah, Peter. And he, he's now sort of a comedian and a podcast guy. He's a very gregarious personality. And he'd say, I don't think I would say this. I'd say, well, why is that, Peter? And he'd tell me. And half the time I'd say, you know, let's go with what you're saying and I'll, I'll rewrite it right now. And half the time I'd say, no, Peter, you would say that because it's not you, it's the character, it's Casey. And he'd laugh. So that was great because I got to be, uh, you know, literally rewrite on the spot. Um, so kind of the big message that I would want to give to, to you, Cheryl, and to Alex and to Kevin is it's really important to be flexible. Um, and you've got to take a lot of hits. People saying, mm. if it's a movie, this is not filmable. And I wish I had listened to some of the people that had said that because I didn't know enough. Now, if I were to produce a movie, I would know way more. Or someone who would say, this book has too much telling in it, not enough showing, which is a cliche, but, um, and I, you know, you might say where you listen. Now, I did have good input on, on my novels, but you have to be flexible, listen to people, but then ultimately go with what you believe. There are some very small examples in both books where a Pulitzer Prize winning author friend of mine gave me some notes on it. And I took, I took their advice and I regret it because they did not understand the scene I later found out. And it's not a big deal, but it, to me, when I read that sec those sections, especially the one section in the second book, I think, oh, he, he didn't know what I was talking about. And he thought this was supposed to be kind of comedic. And um, so you have to, the final judge has to be yourself. And Kevin and Alex, when you're writing, um, listen to people, but ultimately you've, you're the one that's got to take this to the you're the one that's got to take, you know, you got to dance with the one that brung in and, and basically um, you got to be that person. You got to be that person who's going to say, I stand behind it. Um, the final thing I want to impart about what you asked, Kevin, kind of make full circle, was Ernest Gaines, who wrote A Lesson Before Dying, Autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman, one of the great Black writers of the 20th century um, and early 21st century. Um, passed away not long ago. He was my mentor at um, Swanee Writers Conference. I sat, I had lunch with him every day and we sat on rocking chairs and talked in the evenings, he and his wife and, and myself. And his book, um, A Lesson Before Dying, I believe it was, there was A Blood and Dust, and many other great books of black literature and literature. Um, it had sold 75,000 copies, which is huge. That's a bestseller. And I said to him, so Oprah just, I, you know, while, while we were at Swanee right before Oprah had picked his, picked his book when she had her regular book club. I said, so what happened? And he said, he big smile. And I think he'd been doing fine as a professor. He had a, you know, he was doing fine, successful author, but he wasn't, you know, he wasn't over the top. And he said, well, my, um, no, they, no, they had sold 30,000 copies, which is, that connotes, a, that uh, denotes a bestseller. And he said his publisher, the day she picked his book, she turned, his publisher turned on the printing press and went from 30,000 copies to three quarters of a million. And it's gone on from there. It made him, it made him a millionaire. Um, so he was a great person for me to talk to. And one night I was going to do a 45 minute reading at Swanee and Pulitzer winners, National Book Award winners and great writers were there. And I was a wreck because I had picked for whatever reason from the original hardcover book, a section that had 
the language and and other things in it that were as well as graphic scenes. It was by far the most, it was the party scene and around there, Cheryl, by far the most controversial sections of the book. And I had everybody in the off in the audience. And um, I read from it and I, I was gonna read from it. And I was really nervous. I suddenly had total second doubts. So I saw Ernest outside. Um, he was on his way somewhere. I said, Ernest, I'm a mess. And I said, you know, it's got this and it's got that and it's got these epithets. It's got, it's got, um, you know, it's got graphic sex. It's got swearing. It's got F-bombs. I said, but it's this really key section of the book and I have to read for 45 minutes. I said, but it all fits in with the story. And he looked at me and said, Scott, James Bal Jimmy Baldwin and I, James Baldwin, he said, we used to, we were best pals. And he said, we used to run around San Francisco together. And uh, we talked all the time. He said, we, there wasn't a library in Texas that Jimmy Baldwin and mm. I weren't banned from. And then he took a pause and he said, Scott, you wrote it, you read it. So I did. And it went over extremely well. Mm. And I will always credit him with that. You wrote it, you read it, you stand behind it. Um, it's all in your intention. And uh, some very nice things were said to me afterwards by, by people I really respected, groups of people I really respected. And I think that those are the things you take away. So it doesn't make you, you know, a wealthy person like it did Ernest, that's okay. It's, it's very gratifying in other ways. Um, and I'm just glad people like Ernest got to enjoy the fruits of their labors you know, maybe later in his life, but um, a lesson before dying, I taught it at university school, um, like uh, six years later after I met Ernest. So mm -hmm. anyway, so anything else? Anything else I can chat about? Alex, if you're there, um, if you're available, do you have any, any thoughts or questions or Kevin, anything more or, or Cheryl? Uh, no, I was curious what, when you mentioned early on, I mean, now we're at the end, but when you mentioned early on, you were going to read one of your chapters and then comment on it. Were you going to oh, do that? As yeah, a, let me do that real quick. And let me acknowledge, Alex just said, thank you, Scott. It's always amazing to hear your stories. Thanks, Alex. If you want to stay around for just another few minutes, I'll... Um, do you gonna, mind, I, Scott? No, I don't. It's a very oh. short section. Okay. Um, thank you. So this is at the end of the first chapter. And what happens is a bunch of the guys stand around a meadow in the meadow and they start talking and they're goofing off and they're 18, 19 years old. And they're talking about who they have a crush on and which movie actress is the, 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 this woman they have a crush on who's married to their friend next door. And, and you know, is she like Allie McGraw? Is she like, um, um, who are the other ones that came up with back? This is, uh, interestingly, Google, uh, came out the year or the month that my book came out. So I had to do all my uh, research at libraries and stuff, which was actually better for the book. So they're talking about one goofy thing and two of them are, they get into it and they're pounding on each other and messing around and teasing. And um, so then finally the, the conversation comes to um, Vietnam and that creeping feeling of who is going to get drafted, who among us. And so then they all start to settle in. It's in the middle of September as the air is cooling and they go back, back into the farmhouse from being outside in the meadow. And I'm starting sort of uh, right, right toward the end of the chapter. And it says, we went on like that for a while longer. Four 18 year olds in a farmhouse by a meadow in Ohio in the autumn of 1970, not wanting the night to end, drinking tea and beer, laughing and arguing about love and karma and about who the war would take as the breezes of mid-September chilled us for the first time that season. The draft lottery, three months away, hovered, a helicopter with a passenger list that no one would show us. The crickets and cicadas outside who would be gone within weeks sounded like sleigh bells in the 
kitchen. Just after midnight, Hairball, Hairball poured the last half of a beer down his throat and said, I'm crashing. You idiots keep it down now. I'm with Hairball, Phil said, slugging him in the arm as they walked by. Jeff got up, washed out his teacup and said, night, Casey. Don't let it get to you. It's only our whole generation that's getting screwed. We'll know soon enough anyway. Whatever it'll be, we'll know soon enough. He walked part of the way up the stairs, then stopped and turned around. Hell, man, maybe it'll be me. My housemates went off to their rooms. Soon, the music of the Grateful Dead, Hairball's favorite band, wafted out of the room, along with the smell of his latest stash of tie stick. Phil listened to Jimi Hendrix and mourned the guitarist who had died of an overdose a week earlier. He grieved honestly, as if for a friend. Twice, I'd heard him crying. Jeff lit incense and began his evening gongyo, his Buddhist prayers. The sound of his chanting with the music from hairballs and Phil's rooms was like a glorious mad choir of confused angels. Then there's a space break. I poured myself another cup of tea and walked down on the front porch and sat with Lion. The air was crisp and the stars were spread across the sky and I could hear the trees and grass moving together, whispering. Ever since I was a child, I couldn't look up at the stars for long or, I or I'd feel like I'd be drawn into them. So I talked to Lion, kept myself earthbound. A border collie mix, Lion had black satin fur and a small white star on his chest. He sat with his long snout on my thigh, and when I talked to him, he made little dog sighs through his nose. His ears followed the night sounds at Little Meadow. Instead of investigating as usual, he stayed with me, his tail wagging slowly, blinking his big brown eyes, sighing. I fell asleep in the broken white wicker chair on the porch. I didn't dream, but I heard the trees and the grass moving together and felt the breeze across my face and the cold from the north began to move in through my to move through my clothes onto my skin, into me. Autumn came to Little Meadow that night. I knew what was happening around me as I slept. I saw and felt and heard those things, and still I slept, not understanding why my senses were awake and my body asleep. When I woke up, Lion was sleeping at my feet. The night was at its deepest, and Little Meadow was gone from sight, from my sight. So that's the end of the first chapter. And what, what I do want to mention about that is there is not one actual thing in what I read that's ever happened to me. Um, and this particular scene and some of the other scenes now live in my consciousness as if they had happened. Mm. They're almost, they're more real to me than certain things that I can barely remember. Because what happened was I took my sensibilities and my observations and my feelings from that era. And I put them in a blender and this is what I poured out. Um, I wanted to mention too, a couple little things that I checked. Um, I like to put placements into um, a piece so that you give like a hook to the reader to place the time the Grateful Dead. Well, in real life, Hairball loved the Grateful Dead. I didn't, but he loved the Grateful Dead. He would sing them and growl them all the time. <laughs> um, Phil, I imagine, would love Jimi Hendrix. Um, and he would grieve as if for a friend. Well, I had grieved for, for you know, certain musicians. And so I just sort of put that in there. And I know how much people's deaths could mean to fans. But that's also placement of time. And um, and then it was just a sensory thing of the trees and the grass moving. Now, what I described here was as if the narrator, Casey, had a sort of a vivid dream. I've never had one of those. I've never had the sense that I was awake while I was still asleep. But I knew people that had. And I thought, I think he does in this. But the real thing is that a novel itself is essentially a dream. So what I'm really describing I, I believe I've come to think is the process of writing. Your, your, your fiction is a dream and it's a dream that you're putting on paper. So that's kind of the best way that I can describe it is that it, it's, it becomes esoteric and sort of ethereal because the writing process, when it clicks in, 
can become very ethereal when you tap into the really deep places. I know from you, and I'm not just believing, I'm not just saying this. Kevin, I have read your work. You do that. And Alex, you absolutely do that. Um, I mean, unbelievable in touch with your inner emotions. And I just hope you guys keep writing because some of the work that I've seen from you um, has been amazing. So tap into those places and create. That, that would be my, um, my biggest advice. Did you have any questions about what I read? Um, and give yourself permission to make stuff up. I'm so glad that, that, oh, go on, go on. I know that sounds so simple, but it's true. Give yourself permission that when you say, well, I just wrote about something that kind of happened, but I don't want to add that other thing because that never would have happened. Go ahead and add it. You know, uh, it's, it, you have total permission. Fiction is the ultimate freedom, I think. Yeah. And I think that's why children love stories. And mm -hmm. yeah. The wilder, I'm the so better. Glad you read that. And I'm, I'm so glad that you commented on, on your work like that. Um, I really appreciate you taking the extra time to do that because sure. that was, uh, that was the icing. Well, thanks for bringing it back up. I'd forgotten about it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I haven't read from that chapter in many years, but now it's starting to, I'm starting to see why chapters like that might be a little bit more important to me um, because they're more about the inner life. And I, what I tried to do is to capture the inner life of an 18 year old in 1970. And that it wasn't all just, you know, being hippies and smoking dope and protesting the war. That's what we saw. That's what people saw on television. But in reality, people were really thinking and they were really scared. Um, just like now, you know, my black friends and young black friends, Alex's colleagues at, at CIA um, who have talked to me, they're not just about, you know, being out there. They're also worried, you know, and there's fear, the same kind of fear we felt about the war. Yeah. They're feeling about walking outside, including um, Alex's colleagues who are of Asian descent. And, and, and Alex and anybody else, there's so much craziness out there. Yeah. Um, so trying to find the inner life, I think is important. And then how do you write about inner life? Sometimes through the first person can be helpful. So. Well, that was great. Thank you. Sure. Your, what you're talking about reminds me of a friend's grandfather used to say, you never let facts get in the way of a good story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, yeah. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Alex has written about his grandfather and probably had, has, has some great stories. Yeah. Story. So this is Tim O'Brien's big point about the things they carry. People will say to him, is it true? And he'll say, yes, it's true. Or no, it's not true. And does it matter? Does mm -hmm. it matter that if it's true or is it more truthful than if it were true? is the truth that he's writing about more true than true. Hemingway talked about it. Many other authors have talked about it. Fiction allows you to be truthful as opposed to just factual. That's why the things they carried is so powerful. Um, and as Tim gets older, he's starting to talk more about what happened over there. And, you know, if he killed someone and if he's been tortured by it for, 50 some years mm -hmm. and the answer is probably and yes he's been tortured by it for 50 some years i've talked to him personally one-on-one -on -one numerous times and you know it's it, that's what he carries now as do other people i have friends who were in the iraq war vietnam right off their back did their job that's what i had to do or world war ii in my dad's generation uh, korean war um, but there are some people who could kill one person and they can't ever get over it. There are some mm -hmm. people that took out an entire, you know, um, you know, a group of soldiers or enemy and, and it doesn't mean they're better people or worse people. That's just how they handled it. So you have to find your truth and then let your characters find their truth too. 
And I love what you said about being truthful that, it, you know, it's not, doesn't need to be factual. I love that. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think it's great to write memoir. You know, there's a thing that happened. Um, and I, I'll bet you remember this, Cheryl, when James, somebody who wrote a million little pieces and it was supposed to be a memoir and he got an Oprah and it was selling millions and millions of books and it was number one. And then it turned out he made it all up and Oprah had to resend it. And he had, and the publishers pulled, this is in the early 2000s, 90s. They had to pull it off the shelves and republish it as a novel. And he just, it just sunk because people didn't want it to be a novel. They wanted it to be true. There was a, a spate of memoirs that came out um, Shattered Glass is a great movie if you can ever watch it about a guy named something Glass who wrote, who made up stuff for the New York Times. It was a horrible scandal. And um, I, have a, I have a colleague that I was um, at a writer's conference with who is a fellow. And um, he now is a very successful movie director, movie fiction. Um, he does based on movies and he's rich and famous and all that stuff. But he wrote um, a series of of articles for the New York Times Sunday Magazine that turned out to have been partially fabricated. And he was just driven right out of the business. And, um, and he went to, he did, I guess the only thing that he could do, he, I haven't talked to him since, but he went to Hollywood and, and did real fiction. So I do think that memoir should be to the best of one's ability to be accurate. And if it can't be, turn it into a short story. Problem is publishers will say, boy, you know, this really would, because memo nonfiction sells more books, correct, Cheryl? Yes, sells a lot mm -hmm. more that's books. true. Um, and so you, there's still this danger of people writing fake memoirs mm -hmm. and, and sort of embellishing. I think one of the people who, who kind of admits that he embellishes and, and if you take his master class, he tells you he embellishes is David Sedaris. Oh. He, do, he does it for the, in the name of comedy. Mm -hmm. he, he essentially writes uh, short stories that are based on real life. And so I like David Sedaris. I laugh at David Sedaris' work, but I don't trust David Sedaris. And I'd tell him that. And he'd say, that's okay. If you can hear it in his voice, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going back to London to live with you and, and spend my millions. That's okay that you don't totally trust me. I still read them, but I read them with uh, a little bit of, uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily believe everything, but he's funny as heck. He's, I mean, there's almost no one funnier writing today. You know, you know that tradition comes from Mark Twain. Mark, mm. Twain. Mark Twain made up, he'd go on lecture tours. He made stuff up all the time. He lied constantly, <laughs> but, but it was based on things you know, the compression of events or the exaggeration or something that would happen to someone else, you might say happened to him. Um, and, and so Sedaris is essentially a memoirist, yes. So it's, uh, it's interesting. But memoirs are, you do get more leeway with memoirs and es personal essays than you do with autobiography and biography. There, there needs to be a, mm. you know, a very strict standard for autobiography and biography. I remember I read a, a short piece on Ted Kennedy. My friend Ron Powers wrote the seminal book on Ted Kennedy. Ted dictated it to him or with him as he was dying um, called A Lion, something about the lion or something. But um, I wrote a book about Ted Kennedy and it was supposed to be a biography and there was a part in it that said, um, you know, I think I'll go down there and play some foot, touch football, Ted thought to himself. And I went, whoa, 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 wait a minute. This is a, this is a biography and you're in his head. Mm -mm. I closed it. I never read it again. Because that, that's, the, that's the hallmark of a badly written biography. You, you, you might say, you know, Lincoln perhaps had thought about or had expressed in letters or had told people, but you're, if you're going to conjecture, you have to conjecture. And this guy was actually putting thoughts into people's heads. That's not, that's not accurate. That. Can't do that. Mm. Yeah, that's why real biographers 
the Doris Kearns Goodwin and people like that are so respected. You think, Cheryl? Yeah, I think so too, right? Yeah. There's that uh, fine line. You yeah. can't make anything up if you're being doing the autobiography or a biography of somebody. Yeah. Yeah. And you can, if you're doing an autobiography, you can say the way I remember it, it was such and such, but, but not presented as objective truth. But anyway, so yeah. Um, so those were most of the main things that I wanted to mention. Um, and one of the fun, one last thing, one of the fun things is, you know, I'm going to make a practical suggestion that when you write fiction, to write about, I was thinking about this today, I was sitting out in the sun, just kind of letting myself go zen and just thinking, what have I not talked about? I thought, what about the idea that you should set your fiction in a place where you'd kind of like to be or revisit? Um, even if it's a, a desolate planet in, in a science fiction, um, it would be cool to be there. I think you have to create an environment that is rich for you. So I set my second book in Paris, where I wanted to revisit, south of France, where I want, had never been, and um, a fictional version of Chagrin Falls, which I know very well, but changed it around. Um, but I think if, you're, if you enjoy being there, your reader might enjoy mm -hmm. being there. That, that's actually a new one I came up with today because um, otherwise it's gonna be flat. Um, your, your reader wants to, needs to go through that door with you uh, into, into that house or into that, into that bar or into that church, wherever it might be. Um, yeah. That makes sense. Perfect sense. It's yeah. like, as a teacher, I traveled a lot during my career with students. Mm -hmm. And I had been to places, beautiful places, and I couldn't wait to get those best students in my class and see the look on their faces when they turn that corner and see the Eiffel Tower for the first time. Yeah. That's a real joy. I'm not looking at the tower. I'm looking at them with their mouths open and saying, I can't believe I'm here. It's the same thing with a book. Yeah. The book takes you somewhere that maybe you have been, and you relive it, or it takes you somewhere you've never been and you enjoy being there, so. Yeah, I really encourage people. And listen, I am not a voracious reader, but I do love to read books when I'm reading them. <clears throat> I'd like to be a voracious reader, but so I have teaching and writing, and so I'm not able to read as much, but I'm reading a number of books now. It's amazing, and I learned so much. Uh, it's so much fun. It, it definitely affects people differently than film, which I love. And I love TV series and things like that. But reading is a whole different thing. There's nothing between you and the page. Mm -hmm. It goes straight into you. No screen, no anything, just you and the page. So. Right. Well, we've had a wonderful evening. Thank you. It, it's a little unconventional because, you know, we we went right. I didn't give any introductions because you oh, guys sorry. already know Scott. So <laughs> as your teacher. Yeah. And um, so uh, this was really great. And I'm I'm sure I enjoyed listening to it. And I'm not oh. in the process of writing anything. But you guys really, I'm sure this is like an extra class. This is an extra session with your mm -hmm. with your professor. Yeah. And so helpful, I think, because. It he gave us some really good tips. Yeah, the way I looked at it was um, the only thing missing is a cup of coffee or a <laughs> mug of beer. It was we were kind of sitting around a table and, a, and just talking, although I did too much of the talking. But, you know, it's kind of, I sort of feel like um, that's what it was. You know, it was, it was fun. Right. And as, as I told you, whether it's three people, I actually mentioned to you earlier, three people or 300 people, um, it's all the same to me. It's almost better if there are fewer because you can speak right. uh, specifically. And it's very interesting to me that two people who write kind, not, not similarly, but write from a very similar place of deep introspection, Alex and Kevin are the two people here. That to me is almost not a coincidence um, because I've read both their stuff and it's, you know, 
they're coming from a very deep place. So it's great. I'll look great forward to, see to seeing everybody's name on a published book soon. Yep. Yep. <laughs> or a published book of poems, perhaps. So yeah, that would knows? be great. Who knows? Yeah. So um, Kevin, I'll see you next Wednesday. And Alex, keep in touch. Let me know how you're doing. So all right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks, thank you, Scott, so much for spending thank the you. evening with us. And gentlemen, thanks so much for tuning in and and getting some good advice. So now you can great. be inspired to go out and keep writing. Yeah. All right. Thank Take you care, so everybody. That's great. And thank, thank you so, you so much, much, everybody. Okay. Good night. Bye-bye.